Welcome to the e-commerce podcast with Matt Edmondson, a show that brings you regular interviews, tips and tools for building your business online. Well, hello and welcome to the e-commerce podcast with me, your host, Matt Edmondson. All of this week's notes and links can be found on our website at ecommercepodcast.net forward slash 97. Today, find out how you can find your remarkability and use it as a competitive advantage. Oh, yes. If you want a competitive advantage, then it's time to become remarkable. It's as simple as that. Now, whether it's your customers, whether it's with your employees or your investors, being remarkable will set you apart from your competition. The secret, it all starts with finding what makes you unique. What is your remarkability? That's the topic for this week's show. Honestly, I think it's what's going to separate you if you're competing with Amazon, but we're going to get into all of that. Don't go anywhere. I'll be back again soon. Hey there, are you a business owner? Here at Orion Digital, we know firsthand that running an e-commerce business can be really hard work. As the online space gets more competitive, it is becoming even more challenging to stay ahead of the curve. We totally get it. So we wanna help you succeed by offering a wide range of services, from fulfillment, marketing, customer service, and even coaching and consulting, just so that you can do what matters most. Save yourself the time and the money and let us handle the day-to-day -day tasks. This way, you can run your business without having to worry about the boring stuff. So what do you say? Are we a good fit for each other? Come check us out at oriondigital.com and let us know what you think. So thanks for joining us on the e-commerce podcast. It is great that you are here. Now, whether you are starting out or whether like me, you've been around e-commerce for a wee while, the goal of this show, the reason for this show is simple. We're here to help you deliver e-commerce wow. And to do that every week, we bring you two things. Great show sponsors. An amazing guest. We put those together and we have a show. Yes, we do. Uh, we talk to people who are experts in their own field. We get their stories, their insights, their thoughts, their ideas, their pixie dust, you know, all those things that are going to help us grow and adapt online. And today is no exception. We have the phenomenal Rich Brooks joining us. He is a digital marketing pioneer who has been helping businesses achieve their online goals for almost 25 years. He is the founder and president of Flight New Media, a digital agency that's been in business since the dawn of the internet era. I love my conversation with Rich because he and I have so much in common. Yes, we've been around a little while. He is a nationally recognized speaker on entrepreneurship, digital marketing, and social media. In addition to his speaking engagements, Rich is also the founder of the Agents of Change uh, podcast. I'm losing my words there. The Agents of Change podcast, which I've actually been on. Go check it out. I loved my conversation with Rich. Uh, and he also has an annual conference that focuses exclusively on search, social, and mobile marketing. Rich is, because if that's not enough, Rich also is the author of The Lead Machine, The Small Business Guide to Digital Marketing, which is, well, it's a very popular book uh, that helps entrepreneurs and marketeers reach more of their ideal customers online. He appears regularly as the tech guru on the evening news show, 207, which airs on the NBC affiliates in Maine. I don't know where he finds all the time. I really don't. Uh, he has appeared in the Inc. In, he's appeared in Inc. Magazine, the Huffington Post, FastCompany.com, CNN.com, Social Media Examiner, and many, many other places around the web. The man is a genius. He is an hearty man. People want to know what he thinks. And so it was great to get him on the show. So without further ado, We've bigged him up enough. Let's see if he lives up to the hype. Here's my conversation with Rich. 
Rich, great to have you here on the e-commerce podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's great to be chatting with you. Um, and when we and had... it's great to be back. I mean, it's like obviously we've already chatted. Yeah, because I have. had you on my show, and you know, then there's that moral obligation, that ethical <laughs> obligation. You have to have me on. So you know, I'm glad that I really used the uh, reciprocity reciprocity uh, to its fullest extent. So, well, absolutely, um, absolutely, and it, and we had a great time uh, on your show. We, we did loved loved the conversation. Great conversation, and so it seemed only sensible, really, to have you uh, on here and and repeat the the conversation. Well, not repeat the exact conversation, but obviously, you get to talk <clears throat> a lot more than I do on this one, uh, Rich, which is always Excellent. a better way around. I feel. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, it's great, and and who knows? We'll, we'll I guess we'll be doing this back and forth throughout the next you know a few years of our lives. Uh, but it's great to have you on the show. Now, the title of, of well, before we get into this whole thing, just a um, quick bit of background. Whereabouts in the world are you right now? So my offices are in Portland, Maine, which uh, I'd like to say I often joke around is the original Portland, meaning that the Portland that most people think of in the U.S. is Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. But then I realize I'm talking to somebody on the other side of the pond and you guys probably had the original Portland and we just took that name when somebody came over. Yeah, probably. Probably. This is generally how it works. We didn't come up with anything original <laughs> over here. Um, but yeah, so the top right corner of the country, if you're looking at mm -hmm. the U.S. map, about two hours north of Boston. Yeah, Maine, beautiful part of the world. Love it, love it. Moved beautiful up here from Boston, maybe back uh, back in '99, and uh, never thought of moving anywhere else. Yeah, no, fantastic. And so, day to day wise, what what what's your um what's your day to day look like? Well, I run a digital agency, and we do both uh, lead gen and e commerce sites for clients. We do a lot of digital marketing. Uh, we've been doing SEO as a, since before Google. Uh, so we've been doing that quite a while. We do social media, we do email marketing, we do a lot of content creation for our clients and just a lot of strategy around how people can stand out online, how to drive more qualified traffic to the website and basically how to run your business online. Mm. And uh, you've been doing that since before Google. I, li I like that. Phrase. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's true. Like when I first started, there was no Google, there was no Facebook, uh, there were still geo cities for the people on listening oh, who are geez. old enough to remember yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, we're turning 25 years old oh, in wow. just uh, just over a month, wow. uh, about a month and a day. And uh, we've been preparing for this year long celebration because 25 years is kind of a big deal. It's a massive and, deal. Uh, yeah, yeah. Looking back at like what was going on in 1997 to do a bunch of social posts and stuff like that, you know, bands and, and movies, but also things that were going on. <laughs> Like when I was designed, I was the website designer back in 1997 mm -hmm. when I started. And, uh, you know, we were, we were, I was designing websites for screen sizes that were 640 by 480. It's which crazy, now is like a isn't postage it? stamp in the top yeah, left of your screen. It's crazy. And you know what? I, I remember those days because 95, no, when was it? 96, 97 was the year I did my first ever website. I, I designed mm -hmm. my first website back then. And um, I remember, I, I, you know, 97 was the year I got engaged. Uh, 98 was the year I got married. Um, and so I remember that time very, very well. I had an analog watch, for example. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Dial up. That's how I got online yeah. when I first started. I remember when we first got married and got our first house in 98 and you just, you plugged it in and I was so excited when the 56K modem came out. It was remember? like lightning fast. Yeah. <laughs> it only took like two hours to download some screensaver from AOL at that point. <laughs> Yeah, it was just crazy, crazy times and um, uh, f fun times, but crazy times. So, well, you guys, you guys have been around. You must have seen like, like everything, uh, you know, during that it, time. It feels like it. In fact, you know, as a, as we're kind of talking about our twenty fifth and looking back, um, my original newsletters before the company was even called Flight New Media required a stamp to arrive in their destination. I used to. <laughs> write them out in Microsoft Word, print them up on blue paper, fold them and try, you know, thirds, mm -hmm. uh, Xerox them on my dad's uh, he, dad's uh, copier. And then I would literally lick every stamp, lick every envelope and send out like a hundred or so of those newsletters. And uh, that was how I got started doing some internet marketing was real, really old school stuff. That's fantastic. 
That's absolutely fantastic. I remember once, and I appreciate this is not the reason for our conversation, but I am enjoying this little, uh, you know, time Trip of... down memory yeah, lane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's great. I, talking to direct mail, I remember um, in the in the mid-90s sending out letters to people. Uh, maybe it was the late 90s. Um, but sending letters out to people with a fork, you know, sellotape to the paper saying, um, uh, you pick the restaurant, I'll pick up the bill. Uh, and I, a fork, I just thought, you know, would be interesting. In fact, I went to a friend of mine who owned a restaurant and said, just give me a load of your old forks. And so I, I remember mailing them out, just getting lunch appointments with all kinds of various people. That's really funny. Uh, back in the days where direct mail had to be interesting because a bit like email now, you had to arrest their attention because you got loads of letters every day. It's like, yeah, I'm just throwing that one in the bin, throwing that one in the bin. Uh, right. So we put a fork in. But if you get one with a fork in it, that's going to stand out for sure. Well, that was what you had to do back then. I don't know if they would let you send that through the mail anymore, but back then probably, you know, it was like the Wild West. (laughs) Yeah, it was just, it just was the way it was. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy, crazy times. And I remember, I remember when we first started doing a few more online sales, we got one of those machines where you printed postage on a a label and then you stuck it on your, yeah, it's crazy, crazy, crazy. Well, uh, let's move on to maybe 25 years later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before everyone's, everyone under the age of sort of 40 is going, what are you talking about? Um, so 25 years later, you're still doing the agency. You're still in, around the, the digital space. So yeah. you must have learned a few things during that time. One would hope so. Yeah. Well, One would hope so. Yeah. Yeah, you would, really. You, you know, <laughs> if you've not, this will be a very short podcast. Yes. Um, but no, it, it's crazy, isn't it? When you sort of look back over that, one of the things that we chatted about regarding this show was this idea that you've, the remarkability formula. Is that yeah. something that you have picked up over this sort of 25 year period of time? Absolutely. I mean, just in term, it's funny because I never went to school for business. Um, I did run a small business while I, <clears throat> while I was in college, just a typing service. I used to type again. We're so I'm so old. <laughs> when I was in college, first drafts were usually written in longhand mm-hmm. and you could even submit if you had good enough penmanship, your papers yeah, yeah, yeah. in written format. But a lot of people, you know, just either didn't have the penmanship, didn't want to deal with it. So they, I ended up service $1.50 a page and I would just type out your papers. And I always Um, improved them because I was an English major. mm -hmm. Looking back on it with my entrepreneurial skills now, I would have charged $1.50 a page as is, $2 a page if I fix your punctuation and $2.50 a page, I'll guarantee you an A because really it was so easy to get an A those days. So um, (laughs) I didn't do that, but where were we going with this story? This was what you've learned over the last 25 years. I'm sure it'll come back to me. Like I said, it's early over here uh, on the cross <laughs> pond. But yeah, the remarkability for me, it's just, you know, it's it's about learning how to to stand out, kind mm. of like you did with the fork. So um, one of the things, it, you know, that I've learned over the years is, even though I didn't have this business background, that's where I was going with this. Um, I discovered that a lot of people who run businesses have no sense of business at all. And when it came to web design, I just started realizing that people hadn't really thought through how to lay out a page or what, Mm -hmm. you know, all these different things. So about five years in, I realized I was almost more of like a business therapist for a lot of these people than I was a web developer. And that's when we kind of started evolving into where we are today. But we spend a lot of time with our clients up front, kind of trying to find out where they are in the marketplace, which is surprisingly something that very few businesses do, which is probably why the average business, at least in the US, small business folds within five years. So what we started doing is just, you know, because we wanted our clients to succeed is have some of these conversations with them. Simple things like, who is your audience? Who are you trying to sell to? Who's your competition? All those sort of things. Over time, we started to to really work on understanding what made our clients stand out what we could talk about in terms of the marketing arena, what made them interesting and worth remembering. Um, And in the last few years, I took what we had been doing and kind of codified it into this idea of the remarkability formula. So in some ways, it's been something I've been working on for nearly 25 years. And in just in terms of like coming up with the formula aspect of it, that's Mm -hmm. really only been happening in the last couple of years. Yeah, but I, I, That doesn't surprise me. And in fact, I would have probably expected it to be that way because 
mainly personal experience, if I'm honest with you, Rich, that actually what I've learned over the last 25 years, we have frameworks now, but that's based on 25 years of learning. I didn't have those frameworks 25 years ago, but we sort of refined and tested them over the years. And you didn't even know you were doing it. Do you know what I mean? Right. And you kind of look back and go, okay, well, that, that was actually really clever. More by accident than design, but it was really clever. Do you know what I mean? Most of it, most of the brilliant <laughs> ideas I've come up with is more by accident than by design. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. then you're like, oh, that's that actually works. Yeah. yeah. Well done, me. Just, uh, you know, reach over, pat myself on the back. It's like, well done. Um, so, yeah, I, I, but I find a lot of things like that, actually, um, that when you've got that kind of experience, you do create these frameworks. You do create these formulas that start to work. But they're not just put, plucked out of the air. They're plucked out of the 25 years experience, you know, the hard living that you've, you've had to do the good times and the bad times. Right. So, um, that's what makes them, I think a lot more interesting and some, and I, I mean this with all due respect, but you know, when someone in their twenties comes and sells me the winning business formula, I'm kind of like, yeah, I get that you might be the outlier here, but where's the experience? Do you know what I mean? Right. And, and I, I kind of need, I need to understand where this is coming from a bit more. Or the people on Twitter who tell you how to get thousands of followers a day and they've got like three. <laughs> like, Try some of your own medicine first, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the reason why, I mean, sometimes I know that people uh, roll their eyes at marketers or business people who come up with clever names. Or, but part of that is, is because there's so many things to remember that if you can create, if you have some knowledge based on 10, 15, 25 years in business, Sometimes to teach it to somebody else, it helps to really come up with a mnemonic device or yeah. some other way to yeah. pass that along so that they get it and then they can make it their own. Yeah, absolutely. All helps with the uh, all helps with the teaching. So, well, let's dive into it. So, the all formula right. that you've got, um, how would we how would we write it out? What what is it? Sure. So, the way that I look at it is every business is or can be remarkable. And, and I know that word sometimes is intimidating to people, but when I talk about being remarkable, I just mean that there's some element or aspect of your business that's worth remarking upon by the people who are likely to buy from you. Mm -hmm. And what kind of came about from really realizing this is coming up with this formula, these four lenses that I use to help businesses figure out what makes them different, and then to be able to lean into those differences. And this is not rocket science. And I am not saying that I invented a new flavor of Coke or anything like that. I know that there have been people before me who have talked about this. You know, there's been mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, what's your unique selling proposition or unique value proposition, blue ocean strategy, the purple cow. I get all that. The formula aspect of it is the part that I want people to work on because I think it's something that helps anybody tackle this work themselves okay so the four the four lenses that are part of this formula and then mm -hmm. i'm happy to talk about each one in turn and try and give some examples but uh is find focus fashion and frame and just to kind of give you a quick overview of what those things mean to me find is very often if we've been in business for any length of time there already is something remarkable about our business whether we know it or not mm -hmm. and it's just about uncovering what that is and turning turning our attention to it yeah focus is just a way of niching down or niching down as they say outside <laughs> of america um just the idea of you can often accomplish more and make more money by narrowing your focus mm -hmm. Fashion has nothing to do with catwalks or David Bowie songs. No. Fashion is just talking about creating something and um, creating something new. So it may be that you are in a competitive industry, uh, an industry where everybody basically has the same products or services. There's not much yet, at least, unique or remarkable about your business. But you could create something that is not intrinsic to your offering but is in alignment with your mission, vision, or values that will help attract people to you. So, and we, like I said, happy to give examples of all these. And the last one is also a little tricky. It's called frame. And it's the idea of you may already be doing something, but you're not looking at it from the right angle. And if you were just to shift your perspective on it and to promote it through that new uh, perspective, you're going to attract the right type of clients. And a lot of what I talk to about people is you, you've, none of my clients at least can be all things to all people mm -hmm. and very few people out there unless you're selling like coke or toothpaste 
you're not going to be selling to everybody. So it's about finding those people who are your most in alignment with and just making sure they understand that they're part of your brand, part of your vision, mm -hmm. part of your worldview. Fantastic. And I, and this is important, actually, I think, um, right here at the start for any in the world of e-commerce, anybody in business, to be fair, but especially if you're in the world of e-commerce. And I think, um, i I tell you why I think this is important. And that is because this is how you differentiate between you and Amazon. This is how you differentiate between you and your competitors. Absolutely. Right? And um, I often call, you know, people like myself that have got smaller websites, the digital Davids, you know, you're taking on the big Goliaths of the world. And, um, and one of our weapons... Uh, or one of our stones in our slingshot, if I'm going to be true to the story, uh, is is the ability to create this sense of remarkability, this sense of personality, this 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 brand that is worth talking about. Because on Amazon, you're a commodity. On your own website, you are a brand, you are a story, and you can bring that uh, to the market in a way that um, you couldn't through uh, marketplace sites like Amazon and stuff. So. Um, this is why I love these kind of conversations, Rich, um, because yeah. they help me reframe or think about or find an, um, ways to communicate what we're doing and why we're doing it in a way that's going to resonate with our customers, right? Absolutely, because there's always going to be somebody out there with a cheaper version of what we're trying to sell people. Um, and you can't be racing to the bottom when it comes to price. So it's really important. It does mean sometimes when we choose uh, a something to focus on when it comes to our own remarkability or what helps us stand out online, that we are pushing away potential customers, mm. but that's okay. The, the idea is to find the audience that is going to be loyal to you, to be acolytes for your business, acolytes for your e-commerce store, and really work on being the best we can be for those specific people. Yeah, I think that's, that's such an important point and probably worth repeating. Um, it's okay if some of your customers leave you. Yeah, in fact, as you probably know, because you've been doing this for a while, it's wonderful sometimes <laughs> when some of your clients leave you. And sometimes if they don't, you have to show them the door. Yeah. You have to, those conversations. Yeah, yeah. I've had a few conversations where I've ended up saying to clients, it's obvious we can't help you. Here's a phone number of a company that I think will be much better suited towards you, you know. And right. uh, I think when you're first starting out, that just feels like a million miles away. But again, this is just one of the benefits of being around for a little while. You you know when to say no to people that want to give you money uh, is, the, uh, is, the, is the bottom line. So let's go through each one in turn. So the first one was uh, find. Yeah. So find is usually where I start with people, uh, unless it's a brand new business and they haven't really done anything, then that's a little bit hard. But find, there's a lot of meat on the bone when it comes to find. So um, let me give you an example in my own life of a company that I found remarkable, something that they were already doing. Mm -hmm. And when I moved into my first home that I bought, we got there and uh, the, it was in dire need of a paint job. So, you know, I, I wasn't looking forward to this, you know, like the idea that some painting company was going to be there, be on my front lawn for like, you know, five, six, seven days and just, you know, putting up scaffolding and all this sort of stuff. It just like, I didn't want my house to look like it was a construction zone. We asked around, we called a few people. And then one guy said, oh, I can get the job done in two days. And I'm like, done. So when the first day came, he shows up, there's five vans, about 20 guys spill out of this. They throw up the ladders. They paint the entire house um, top to bottom in a single day. I think they were saying she sea shanties the whole time, but I might be just embellishing the story right now. But they're and they're done. And then two days later, after the paint is dry, they come back and they put on the second coat and it's just the same way. Well, as you can imagine, I don't know what it's like over there, but here it's like, usually you, you hire somebody to do your paint, paint the outside of your house. It might be two guys, might be three or four. That's about mm -hmm. it. So 20 guys and five vans. I mean, of course, all of our neighbors, you know, were asking questions about it. They thought it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And just going from before to after just a matter of days was really a, an incredible thing. It was, it was remarkable. So that's just one example where it's, and here's another aspect of remarkability. If you can do something that's hard to emulate, that's even better. Because yeah, yeah, what yeah. you're trying to do, besides attract the right type of client, is keep your com competition at bay. And employing 20 uh, day laborers 
is a very challenging thing, especially in Maine, where it's a short season where you could actually paint houses because the winter is so long. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very difficult thing to do. So your competition is not going to try and compete with you by hiring, you know, 12 more guys just so they can look like you do. But so that's one example. But when I talk to people, we take a look at a lot of different things. Like one thing is pricing. And I'm not talking about trying to be the least expensive option out there that mm -hmm. that can be a terrible business decision um, what i'm talking about is going to the extremes so for example when um what was it uh gray goose came to market it was already going to be an expensive vodka when mm -hmm. it came to market um it was using a very specialized wheat from a specific area of france and had this whole process on how to make vodka um, and at the time the premium brands were all like 17 dollars a bottle and they certainly could have gone head to head with them maybe make their theirs a couple bucks less but instead they decided they call themselves a super premium brand and started selling bottles for $30 well above anybody else. But of course this attracted people because it was remarkable. It's worth talking about. And if you had gray goose in your liquor cabinet or in your bar, it showed a certain level of sophistication, a certain level of success. And all of a sudden people couldn't, you know, stop buying enough of this. And they ended up, I think it was like two to three years later, selling the company to Bacardi for $2 billion. Dollars. Oh, wow. So just one example, like it, now there are people who go low and that's really good too. Uh, Columbia Record House was a popular way of getting albums back when I was a teenager, 11 albums for one penny. Now that was pretty remarkable. Just the idea that they would sell you 11 for one and all you had to do is buy one at their price. Mm -hmm. But just the idea of that got people talking about it. So it could be about going high. It could be about going low. Mm -hmm. uh, another example is Radiohead. They put out an album. They said, pay what you want for it. And they yeah. put it online. And uh, although there was some controversy around it, it made more money. Um, it made more money in the three months that it was only available online than their previous album had. And when they finally launched the exact same list of music on a physical album, it went straight to number one. Yeah. You know, uh, so it's just, it's an incredible story. And again, it was remarkable. The idea that you could pay whatever you wanted, even if that was zero. So those kind of things are remarkable. They get people talking and it's about going to the edges mm -hmm. and finding, trying to do something or delivering it in a way that's different than everybody else. That is, that's great. And I like how you can do that around price. Um, I, I'm just going to throw another story in here just because I can. And I, and it, I remember talking to a lady who, um, who was running a burger joint, uh, a burger bar in in London? Um, uh, she, I was talking to her, and she, was, I was saying, "How's it going?" And she goes, "Oh, we're struggling a little bit." And um, looking at the menu, tasted the burger. The burgers were great, and I'm like, "Okay, if I was to look at the price of the burgers down the road, would they be the same?" Oh yeah, we're we're all pretty similar around here. Would they be the same flavors? Yes, they'd all be the same flavors. I'm like, what you need to do is instead of having a ten dollar burger on your menu, is go and figure out how to sell a burger for a hundred quid, right? Um, just go and find me the uh, do whatever, put caviar um, with it, lobster tail. I I don't even know, but create a hundred pound experience because no one else is doing that. And then what that does, uh, which I, I found. A really interesting consequence of this is if you have the $100 burger, you can put all your other burgers up to $15 because everyone's comparing the price of the $15 burger yeah, against anchoring. the $100 burger. You're anchoring it as opposed to against everybody else, right? I remember being in the Savoy uh, uh, with one of our suppliers once um, and uh, he, was buying, he was buying the cocktails. And um, I remember looking at the menu and, and the price of a gin and tonic was like 16 quid, which is what, about $20, $25, somewhere around there. And I remember thinking, man, that's really expensive for a gin and tonic, even for the Savoy, right? You, right. You, I would, I'd probably expect to pay maybe maybe half of what they were charging. And um, and then I turned the page and they had cocktails for 700 quid. And I'm like, who in the world is going to buy a cocktail for 700 pounds, which is like $1,000? I thought this is just insane. Um, and then I turned the page and there was one cocktail which they had, which was £12,000, £12,000 for one drink, which is what, like seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000. And I said to the waitress, I'm sorry, but does anybody actually buy the £12,000 cocktail? And she said to me, she said, you'll be amazed how many of those we sell. Um, yeah. And here's what it did, Rich. When, when I saw that, 
when I saw the £12,000 cocktail, in my head I thought, three or four hundred quid for a cocktail is not bad. I might try one of those. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? How Just how the pricing yeah. had changed my thinking. When I came from the bottom up, it was stupid expensive. But when I started at the top and worked down, I thought, actually, that's not bad. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say the biggest mistake they made is not putting that 12,000 pound one on the first page and then continue to go lower. But uh, yeah, I remember years ago, they sold a million dollar cocktail at uh, the Kentucky Derby, which is a famous horse race in the US, uh, mint julep, which is the official drink of the Kentucky Derby. But it and to make it worth worth, quote unquote, a million dollars. It's like they flew ice in from the Arctic. That was only, (laughs) that was like the only ice they would put in this. And it came in a very fancy glass, not glass, like a silver cup that you would keep and stuff like that. But there's, you know, the bottom line is no matter what they did, they couldn't probably bring their prices up above a hundred dollars, but it's that idea that uh, it's remarkable. And if I order it, obviously I have a million dollars that I can just throw away. Mm. So of course, you know, everybody's going to be looking at me. So this is a great first point. Find uh, your remarkability. There's plenty of meat on your bone. Look at your pricing. What can you do at the extremes? I think this is brilliant. Uh, We're going to get... And just not pricing. Like I'd say your people, your product, Mm -hmm. your delivery. Like look at the things that you're already doing and ask current clients, what is it about us that you keep on coming back? You know, find out because you may not realize what it is that you do that's actually attracting your ideal customer. That's such good advice. And it's always it's always one of those things, isn't it? When you actually talk to your customers, for me, there's always that ah. Right. Aha. You know, that we call them the aha moments, don't we? And you're like, ah, okay. Did not anticipate that coming out of your mouth. I mean, we did um we made a slight error in one of my companies last week. Um I made a slight error in one of our companies last week, which I put my hands up and apologized to our customers for. We had within a matter of hours, like um It was overnight, so we had like 80 emails just coming from our Australian customers. Um, I read every single one of them, and I'm going through it going, "Uh uh-huh, okay. Do you know what I mean? And and the stuff that you find out is absolutely fascinating, so very, very important point. Uh, Don't go anywhere. We are going to take just a few moments to listen from, uh, to hear from this week's show sponsors, and then Rich and I will be back. Did you know that nutrition is one of the keys to maintaining the energy you need to drive your business forward? Vegetology creates incredible unique supplements in an eco-friendly, ethical and sustainable way that feed your body with the precise nutrients it needs. We're not just making you healthier, we're helping to protect our planet too. Our products are vegan friendly and approved by the Vegan and Vegetarian Society. Plus, they're gluten-free so they fit perfectly into any lifestyle. They also contain no artificial colors or flavors, making them good for your taste buds too. You can feel good about your food choices with our healthy, natural supplements. We have something for everyone, whether you want to boost your immune system or just get more energy every day. And we're always working on new ingredients so that we can provide even better products in the future. So what are you waiting for? Get started now by heading over to vegetology.com. Hey there, are you a business owner? Here at Orion Digital, we know firsthand that running an e-commerce business can be really hard work. As the online space gets more competitive, it is becoming even more challenging to stay ahead of the curve. We totally get it. So we want to help you succeed by offering a wide range of services, from fulfillment, marketing, customer service, and even coaching and consulting, just so that you can do what matters most. Save yourself the time and the money and let us handle the day-to-day tasks. This way, you can run your business without having to worry about the boring stuff. So what do you say? Are we a good fit for each other? Come check us out at oriondigital.com and let us know what you think. So, Rich, we have started on part one of the formula find. We've talked about pricing. We talked about um, maybe, you know, talking to your customers and looking at some of these other things on the extreme. Is there anything else to think about in this section of the formula before we move on? 
Uh, there's always more to talk about, but I think that it's definitely we can move on to some of the other topics. You Otherwise, and I could probably trade stories for hours, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. It'll be a very long podcast. So we, we move from fine to focus, um, and you briefly explained that in terms of niching or niching down. Um, uh, ex- expand on that one a little bit. Yeah, so you kind of hit on an important point earlier that when you're first starting out, uh, it, it always feels like you want every single piece of business and you want to be everything to everybody. And that's just a terrible, terrible approach. And I understand why we all did it. But the bottom line is just by behaving that way, A, you look needy, you look like you don't, you're, you're un, uh, unfocused. So the whole idea here is what can you do to focus your attention? And some of the suggestions could be good or bad for your business. Ultimately, you have to decide that. But for example, um, you know, John Lee Dumas, who is the Entrepreneurs on Fire podcast yeah, host, yeah, yeah. is a good example of niching down. Uh, when he first started, you know, he's told me the story a few times, but when he first started, he uh, was preparing to launch a business podcast. And he had talked to everybody who was in the industry at the time, it was a much smaller industry of people doing podcasts. And he was trying to figure out what he could do. He's like, well, they all have excellent guests. They all ask great questions, you know, and they're all professionally recorded. If he just went a little bit more like a slightly better guest or had slightly better audio or slightly better questions, nobody would have cared. Nobody would have mm-hmm. noticed. Mm-hmm. So what he ended up doing is he said, he said, I am going to do a daily podcast because everything else was weekly. And all the people who he spoke to, all the experts We're like, that's a terrible idea. No one wants a daily podcast. No one can keep up. They'll listen to a few days and then they'll quit. And it was good advice for the time. But he's like, you know what? I think that there is a smaller audience in here of people who want daily uh, inspiration from other entrepreneurs. And I'm going to feed that very narrow niche of audience. And that's what he did. And yeah, a lot of people couldn't keep up with a daily episode, but there was a subsection that could, and that subsection continued to grow. Not only that, but by putting out a daily podcast, his skills improved 7x over what they would have if he was doing a weekly podcast. And because he was doing a daily podcast, people were talking about him. So whenever like a member of the press wanted to do a story on podcasts, they would always be referred to John and his star just continued to rise. And there's a lot of reasons why John Lee Dumas is a huge success, but this is one of them for sure. He even talks about it in his book as well. It doesn't have to be just that. It could be anything. So, you know, I, when I moved into my new home, I was looking for oil delivery services and I looked online and I found the one with the cheapest prices. Cause you know, to be honest, as long as the oil comes, I really don't care where it came from. So, um, and there was one that had the lowest prices and I looked online and I was just on the cusp of their delivery area. So I called up and they said, well, we don't deliver to that neighborhood. Um, and I, you know, I asked, you know, it's only one block, literally it is one block away. I'm looking at the map and she says, hold on. She, goes on hold she comes back she goes yeah we're not we can't do it we apologize here's a couple of other places and i really respected that because even though it seems like well why would you give up on a customer who's just one block away they had figured out exactly where they wanted to deliver and that's how they kept the rate so low because they knew that every one of their customers was going to be in this small geographic area that it wasn't going to cost them a lot in gas to deliver the oil and by doing that they could remain the cheapest route but they couldn't take me on as a client but again that's okay so in that case they shrank their delivery area. Could you shrink your hours? Could you reduce the number of ingredients? Could you decide to narrow the people you're willing to sell to? Maybe you only go after women or only after men or only after people overset, whatever it is. Like, what can you do to narrow this, to focus in on either delivery or product or audience? And while I was doing the research into this, I I stumbled upon this really interesting fact that I think it was back in 2017, which last year they had the numbers for this. The average American primary care physician, general doctor, was making uh, an annual salary of $297,000, or I'm sorry, $249,000 a year, which Mm -hmm. is great money. But the average specialist was making 399,000, wow. about $150,000 more a year for actually knowing less about being a doctor. I mean, not really, but you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, like yeah, he's, yeah. He or she is able to help less people. We are willing to pay more money for specialists 
than we are for generalists. So again, as you're thinking about your e-commerce store, you know, what kind of things can you be doing to narrow your focus? Maybe you've been trying to replicate Amazon and sell everything, but really you're never going to beat mm -hmm. Amazon. So why not be the best in, you know, dog food or the best in bicycle parts or the best in whatever it is, or go after a very specific audience, that's going to be where you really start to become an expert. And when you focus all your attention on that smaller audience or on that smaller niche or niche, you become the expert and people start looking to you. And if you're online, like an e-commerce store, people start linking to you as well. And that's going to help your SEO, which is ultimately also going to drive traffic to your website. Very, very good advice. Very good advice. Yeah, and I, yeah, check out the John Lee Dunamis uh, podcast because it's Entrepreneurs on Fire. It's a fascinating podcast, actually. I've learned a lot listening to him over the years. And um, Very interesting I'm, guy. I'm one of those guys that dips in and out of John. Uh, I do that with every podcast I listen to, to be fair. Um, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, definitely check it out. Okay, so find focus fashion. Yeah, so fashion, like I said, is uh, maybe there's something extrinsic to what you're offering if you don't have something if you haven't found anything because you know as you go through these if you haven't found anything yet maybe what you can think about is what could i add to a product or service or what could i do external to this that would attract people would make me worth remarking upon and so one example of this is uh ben and jerry's ice cream which i think is an international brand oh yes it comes out well, of it's in the yeah. uk so it must be yeah yeah <laughs> um, and a few years ago, they released a new flavor called Pecan Resist Ice Cream. And, you know, it's a series of different delicious and savorful flavors that they mix in, but they called it Pecan Resist. And the reason they called it that, besides the fact there were pecans in there, was the idea that they were going to take $100,000 of the profits and give them to four progressive organizations that they felt were fighting then President Trump's regime. They were very anti-Trump. They, they wore their beliefs on their sleeves. Um, and when you look at the social media impact of the release of that particular line of ice cream compared to all the others, it's night and day. It's like 100x in terms of the attention. And articles were written about it. And of course, some people swore off uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream because they, they liked the former president. Mm -hmm. But for the majority of people and the people who were in alignment with Ben and Jerry's mission, which is they're very liberal and they're very out there about it. This was just a reinforcement. And they knew that by buying this ice cream, they were supporting these progressive organizations. So again, I'm not saying you have to get political on this, but they created something that was in alignment with their beliefs that they knew would really resonate with their audience. Um, you know, here in America, there's a company that's called My Pillow, and the person is a huge fan of President, ex-President Trump. There's nobody in this country that would buy a My Pillow pillow. Uh, unless they're making a political statement. Like, you know, it's, it's just, it comes down to that. You're either going to get it or not get it, but not based on whether you need a good night's sleep. So it really, like, these are things we choose to do because we want to be in alignment with the brand. Um, for me, I, I didn't plan on this, but I put together my conference uh, that we were holding pre-COVID for eight years called Agents of Change, um, just because I wanted to put on an event in Maine that would bring in speakers from around the country, around the world to talk about digital marketing. Now, you don't need to buy a ticket to Agents of Change to work with my company, Flight New Media, nor the other way around. But there's, there's the idea of Agents of Change is trying to teach people how they can be better at digital marketing. And Flight mm -hmm. is a digital agency that helps people with their digital marketing. They're in alignment. Mm -hmm. When I would get up on stage to introduce the day and to do my presentation, people saw somebody who was both from Agents of Change and from Flight New Media. So immediately, anybody who came to the conference became much more aware of my company. Mm -hmm. And over the years, as people, you know, we asked people, how did you find us? A lot of them would say things like, oh, well, I went to your conference for the last five years, but it's only now that I need a website, only now that I need SEO. Mm. So again, it wasn't the original purpose of this. And you can go to the conference and never hire Flight New Media. But the fact that these things are in alignment and it's extrinsic, we fashion this, mm. again, accidentally, not on purpose, but we fashion this. And this has been a great generator of business 
for cool. flight new yeah. media. And have you found that with a podcast as well? Because the podcast is called Agents of Change, right? And so correct. Um, originally, the podcast was called The Marketing Agents, but then I realized that's a lot of different brands to manage. So we actually just after episode one hundred, <laughs> we combined it, we changed the name. Um, we do get some business from the podcast for sure. And one of our biggest long term clients came from the podcast. They never would have heard of us otherwise. Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking to people and we're working on the fashion side of, of the equation, we're often talking about like, is there a local charity or nonprofit that's in alignment that you could partner with? Is there, could you be doing some sort of event or some classes or something like that? Um, you know, one of the things I've seen is, you know, somebody has a dry cleaner and what they do is anytime something's not picked up after 30 days, they give it to this service that helps people who are down on their luck get jobs by giving them clean clothes, fresh clothes to go into interview. So, mm -hmm. you know, and they talk that up. So there's a lot of things that you can be doing that are in alignment with your mission and vision that are going to help you become remarkable and get people to check you out. You know, Tom's of Maine yeah. is a famous example, or yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, Tom Shoes. Yeah, Tom Shoes, yeah. You buy one pair and another pair goes to a needy person. Mm. Everybody always talks about that. That was a very remarkable idea back when they first did it. Yeah, it was. And the, in fact, the idea was more remarkable than the shoe itself. Um, <laughs> I and never really put one on, but yeah. yeah it, it, it was one of those, wasn't it? And you just thought that's a very clever, very powerful way of, of um, so, and actually his book, uh, Start Something That Matters, um, the guy that started Tom's is uh, is a fascinating book, and one that you should definitely definitely read. Um, but now again, that's really powerful. I like that. So we've got find we, uh, we've got focusing. Um, maybe start a podcast, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or a or a conference is what we're saying for your e-commerce brand. Um, the last one, framed. Let's expand on that a little bit more. Yeah. So frame fashion usually requires somebody to go off and do some thinking. Frame is kind of the same thing. Um, the best example I've seen of frame is a story that uh, I read in the Introverts Edge. It was a guy who uh, Matthew uh, Pollard, I believe, he mm -hmm. actually was on my podcast years ago. And um, he is a business coach that helps people kind of brand themselves. And there was a woman in the Bay Area of California who was teaching Mandarin to anybody who wanted to learn it. Mm -hmm. She had a good steady business. But then as time went on, uh, especially around the uh, beginning of the internet, things really taking off, she found that there were a lot of new people entering the business who were willing to take a lot less money to kind of build their clientele. And so that kind of started to cut into her profits. People were more interested in going for the cheaper uh, offers. And then uh, when things like Fiverr popped up, suddenly you have people in China teaching this, teaching Mandarin for so cheap, there's no way you could possibly compete. Mm -hmm. And she was, you know, having to lay people off and she was really struggling with her business. And he took a look at her business and he's like, well, what, what are, who are these two people? And it was two people who had been uh, moved by their job to go to China. And she explained, yeah, not only am I, you know, did I teach them Mandarin, but I also ended up Show, talking to them about Chinese business rituals so that they would be better when they got to China. And I also taught the spouse and children Chinese as well so they would be able to better um, uh, get into Chinese society and succeed, you know, while, they're, while their spouses were working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, so it sounds like you kind of help people succeed in China, not just teach them Mandarin. She goes, yeah, I guess so. And he's like, well, from now on, you're the China success coach, and you're only going to take on clients who are being moved from the relocated uh, by their businesses to go there. And we're actually going to reach out to all the recruiters who deal with this sort of stuff. Once they did that, she could charge whatever she wanted. It was a business mm -hmm. expense. She was hugely successful, and she didn't have to worry about people trying to undercut her. And that's the idea, Frank. She didn't change anything in what she was offering but she changed the perspective in what she was offering to really kind of focus on some of the benefits. And then the other interesting thing is they also uh, started to use focus as well, where they're not going to go after any other business and they're going to talk specifically to the people yeah. who are finding those people. So another important thing here is it's not just about finding one thing that makes you remarkable and stopping the exercise. It's about continuing to go through and using find, focus, fashion, and frame till you create this, this position in the marketplace that no one else can touch. They wouldn't want to. They'll go find their own remarkability. Mm -hmm. And here in, in Portland, Maine, there's easily 50 you know, people doing websites and, and internet marketing. 
Um, I have found my niche. I found what makes us remarkable, and it's the Agents of Change Conference, and it's the I'm the local tech guru on the NBC affiliates here in in, in Maine. Um, but other people have found their own remarkability. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're the least expensive, or they only focus on e-commerce, or they only focus on nonprofits, um, or they are an all-woman shop. Whatever it is, they're creating their own remarkability. So those are the steps that you can take to really uncover if I am just selling widgets, how do I stand out? Or if I'm selling the same product that Amazon also carries, whether it's the exact same product or something similar, how can I attract people to use my store, mm-hmm. even if I don't have Amazon Prime or the equivalent, yeah. um, and get them to to buy with me? So find, focus, fashion, and frame uh, is your remarkability formula. Uh, thank you for sharing it with us. I guess my, in, as we sort of come into the the, the the top of the time as they say um this is great right and I, I can see me sitting in a park with a journal writing those four things out thinking about the company and coming up with some great ideas to increase our remarkability to help us stand out and position ourselves a little bit better in the market but what do i do with that information once i have it because journaling or writing about something or brainstorming with your team is one thing but actually Actually, getting that weaved into my business is is something else, right? Yeah. Well, and I definitely have thought a lot about it being a digital marketer myself. So some of it, like I said, is about um, some of it would be in the messaging. So the messaging on the product pages, the category pages, the front page, the blog, and any social channels that we're doing. So, you know, those would be some of the places where I would be continuing to hone in on this message where I'm going to attract the right type of people. Also, by being a specialist, um, I also am likely to attract links from other people. And like I said, that's a huge benefit from search engine optimization. Um, So those are just a few of the ways in my email communication. So a lot of it is once I've identified this, how do I communicate this? And then if I'm doing advertising and I should be doing some form of advertising, how do I use targeting and social media and paid search to get my message in front of the people who are actually going to respond to that. Because if I've got the cheapest product out there, some people are going to be wildly enthusiastic about that. And other people are not going to care at all because they're more interested in service or Mm. deliverability or reliability or things like that. So it does help focus my targeting on advertising. It can greatly increase my SEO, um, especially if I'm doing, uh, Uh, surveys with my current clients, hearing the words they use and then using them in my copy myself. And then when somebody who's like them goes to do a search at Google, they're more likely to find a site like mine as well. So it's really about getting clear on the message, leaning into it, and then putting into all your communications and into all your targeting for advertising. Have you found um, any difficulty, uh, let's say, um, I'm a medium e-commerce business, medium-sized business. I'm doing probably around, I don't know, three, $4 million a year in turnover. I've got a couple of staff. Um, we've maybe plateaued a little bit. And I, I'm, I'm at this stage now where I'm thinking about this remarkability thing and going, yeah, actually, we need to reposition ourselves. And I've got some ideas on how to do that. Mm-hmm. Have you found any difficulty in getting the, the staff or the team to buy into that idea? <sighs> I have not, but I will say that sometimes you need to repeat things. Like if you're talking to your team, because I'm an owner like you are. um, And sometimes when I realize like we're not doing something we should be doing or the focus is wrong, whether it's like I need you to do more billable hours or I need you to do more on the customer service side of things or we need to be experimenting more. I've painfully discovered saying it once doesn't matter. Saying it once at every staff meeting for two years starts to matter. So I think it's partially, I think it's partially a matter of, um, I, I don't like the word repetition, even though yeah. that's what it is. It's about consistency. So if you decide that you're going to go in this direction and it's hard to give an example without, but you know, like if you decide that we're really going to narrow our audience or we're really going to narrow our, uh, the product that we're carrying or, or whatever we do, are talking about, or the delivery is only going to be by drone going forward, whatever it is that's going to make you stand out. Um, you have to keep on reiterating that to your staff and explain to them why this is so important and, mm. and so valuable. Um, and, and you did a great job when I interviewed you talking about uh, one of your employees who went the extra mile for somebody and that person was just completely wowed um, and probably has told that story a hundred times. So uh, I won't say what it is. People have to listen to my podcast. Yeah, yeah, go for it. It. But um 
but that kind of thing, like once you start talking to your staff about it, not once, but maybe 10, 15, a hundred yeah. times, you shift the direction of your company and people come along with you. And are there going to be people who don't, if it's a dramatic, dramatic shift? Yeah. There'll probably be people who like your, you know, your mission and vision and values don't match up with where I thought mm -hmm. we were going and they move on. And just like shedding certain customers, shedding certain employees is best for everybody. They yeah. can go off and do what they were put on this planet to do, and you can continue doing what you want to do. Exactly. That's very well said. Uh, remarkability uh, or being remarkable means it's repeatable, right? And so if something, they always used to say to me, if something's worth repeating, it's worth repeating, uh, which is uh, a sensible sentence, I think. And, um, and, and that's true. I think that's true in your messaging with your team. I think it's true in with the messaging with your computers. I think it's true, actually, as a leader with the messaging with yourself, you know, just reminding yeah. yourself, this is why I'm here. This is what we're standing for. This is um, what we're trying to, you know, trying to do to make the world a better place or, you know, whatever it is that you, you know, gets your boat floating. So um, I, I, I like that advice. Uh, so once you've figured out your remarkability, just keep keep talking about it, keep talking about it to every man and their dog, right? Just keep putting Absolutely. it out there. And um, and keep aware also if your competitors are trying to copy you as well, because mm -hmm. you may continue to evolve what's remarkable about your business. What was remarkable five years ago may not be remarkable today. Yeah, yeah. That's very true. Next day delivery was great 25 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, we talked about like how 56K modem and how exciting that was. And now yeah. it's like if a website loads in less than four or in more than four seconds, we're like, what's wrong with my connection? Yeah. You know, well, we're out. I'm, out. I'm off to the next website. And it's got, yeah. you know, I'm downloading video and everything, which would have taken three days to download. Uh, no, that's that's top advice. Uh, Rich, listen, um, tell us about the podcast and tell us how people can reach a hold of you. Sure. Uh, if you love these kind of conversations and you're really focused on digital marketing, check out the Agents of Change podcast. Uh, it's available on just about every platform out there. You can ask your smart speaker. Uh, if you want to check out my website, my agency website, it's takeflightflyte.com. If you want to connect with me, I am The Rich Brooks on just about every social media platform out there. Yeah, and we'll, of course, link to all of those things in the show notes as well. Um, but definitely check out the Agents of Change podcast. Usually... He has really good guests on there. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been fun doing it this way around, Rich, not going to lie. It, uh, do you find, I don't know if you're like me, there's a very big difference between being the host of a podcast and being a guest on the podcast. Oh, it's a lot more work to be the guest, I think. I, I mean, I, I don't mind it because you can just show up and talk sometimes. Yeah. But uh, when I'm the host, all I need to do is just kind of like bumper people in a certain direction and that's about it um, but then I, how, how many episodes do you have on your podcast under your belt well funnily enough you are episode 99 so Ooh, we're not as far nice. as you but you're a you're a pretty no, significant milestone right. exactly so um yeah and and i think like as you start doing them over and over and over again you just get good at understanding how to get the best out of people so yeah. like everything else there's a certain amount of experience that's required there is. And I and like you, I'm, I I love being a guest. I'm, and I'm always flattered when people ask me if I can be on their show or, uh, you know, whatever. And we go on and we talk about e-commerce and it's great. But when I'm in this chair, I get to control the conversation. I get to ask the questions, right? And yeah. I've just got to listen and ask the question. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, and I, I that's the thing I love about this show. And um, yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it, when you're sat on the other side of the table uh, on, on both, uh, both those things. But no, I appreciate it. Listen, Rich. You're a legend, an absolute legend. Really appreciate you being I don't on know the show. That. But listen, I love our conversations, Matt. And let's find more excuses to come on each other's show in the future. Absolutely. Thanks, brother. Well, a big thanks to my very special guest, uh, Rich Brooks. What did you think? I love my conversation with him. He's such a top dude. I really enjoyed being on his podcast, um, and I enjoyed having him on our podcast. It's always different when you run your own podcast and then you go on their podcast if that makes sense because you're not you're not in control of the conversation you're not you're 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 not asking the questions which is it's a really strange thing uh, but he was such a gracious host so do check out his podcast we will put a link to that uh, and of course a link to all of the notes and transcript from today's show just head on over to ecommercepodcast.net forward slash 97 it will be there and it will help you find your remarkability and if that's not enough and you want more because we know 
you want more an insatiable appetite i'm the same way to be fair uh, next week we have uh, a good friend of mine and just an all-round top egg called pat collins patrick collins who is going to be talking to us about drum roll please linkedin events and how you can get the most out of them for your e-commerce business now might not sound at first glance, you kind of go, what, LinkedIn events for e-commerce? Yeah, trust me, it's a fascinating conversation. And to prove it, here is an excerpt from my chat with Pat. Um, I think the world is a completely different place now that people don't want to be cold called, they don't want to be sold to. And so over the past two or three years, my whole approach to LinkedIn changed to say, how do you mix these two sort of circles? And one circle is outbound and one circle is inbound and how do you mix them together? So you think about all the e-commerce businesses you work with, um, inbound is incredibly important. SEO, backlinks, paid ads, all these things to drive traffic to you. But very rarely e-commerce will do too much outbound of go out and find a client because it's, it's a bit more difficult. And what's really cool about LinkedIn is you have this um, sort of platform where you can create content, you can create posts, you can create all the traffic to come to you. But you can also find anybody and just send a message. And if you combine these two together, you have this machine where people are constantly coming to you and learning about you. But at any one time you want to speed it up, you can start to reach out and message them as well. As I said, Pat is a top bloke. You're going to want to check it out. So the way you get these podcasts delivered direct to your inbox, of course, is if you subscribe. Either subscribe to the email, and we'll email and you let them know and let you know when they're out, or just subscribe on whatever platform you use to download your podcasts or on YouTube if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, of course, if you do download this from a source like I don't know, uh, Google Podcasts or uh, Amazon Music or Stitcher or Apple iTunes, wherever you get them from, it'd be great if you could give us a rating and some reviews. We do read them. We do want to know what you think. Uh, it'll be great to hear from you. It just helps us grow the podcast and deliver more and more great content. It's really fascinating. You know, I say this every week that actually when you share it out, it helps as it does. Uh, it really does, which is why we say it. What fascinates me is when we first started the e-commerce podcast, we had to hustle to get sh people onto the show. Now we're in, you know, season gazillion and we've been around for a little while and we've got a good listenership and we have, you know, and I'm super grateful to all of you who regularly tune into the show, share out and review and all that sort of stuff. We have a list as long as you're on with people who want to come on the show. And so we get to pick and choose the great guests. And it's it's a beautiful thing. It really is. So if you keep doing what you're doing, I keep doing what I'm doing. We create some amazing content. It is a win-win scenario. So let's keep doing it. As I said at the start of the show, all of the notes, links and transcripts to today's show are online. You can get them for free. No email, no nothing. Just head over to ecommercepodcast.net forward slash 97. They are there waiting for you to help you deliver your e-commerce well. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, it's great to be with you and I will see you again next week. So that's it from me. Bye for now. You've been listening to the e-commerce podcast with Matt Edmondson. Join us next time for more interviews, tips and tools for building your business online.